uh, you know, all of us have some sort of an entrepreneurial itch. Uh, sometimes it gets manifested in uh, doing a startup or like some of these people are uh, doing a consulting um, company in their 3.0 phase. So uh, Andrew has had an awfully interesting journey. <laughs> And I'd like you to talk to us a, a little bit about uh, how you came to this place of doing uh, transformation digitally uh, for healthcare companies. I'm, I'm fascinated by that. I think we can relate to and maybe learn from uh, what a 30-something is thinking these days. Uh, so, uh, Andrew, uh I'll just uh, quit talking so much, but I will be asking you some questions uh, that would maybe help you to address things that would be of interest to Medvalistas. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you all for being here. I will take the screen share if now, if that's okay. And let's just actually one second confirm. Okay, uh, everyone can see it? Yes. In good shape. Awesome. Um, so yes, you are, you're correct, Jim, uh, in what you said that I do not come traditionally from a healthcare background. A lot of you guys probably know folks in healthcare who have taken an interest in tech and are now trying to figure out ways to bring tech into the, into the realm. They know I'm actually the inverse. So I come from tech and I'm now getting deeper into healthcare. And what it does is perhaps provides or, or puts me in a position to know more about what's out there uh, you know, cross industry wise and be able to perhaps leverage that for the benefit of healthcare. Because what we like to say, and I'll, I'll harp on this again at the end of the, the chat here too, the way to drive innovation is to look outside your industry. If you're just looking at what your competitors are doing or what others in your industry are doing, a lot of times there's a little bit of catch up, but very rarely is there a leapfrog moment. That often happens when you look outside the industry and say, how can I take what they're doing in automotive? How can I take what they're doing in even, you know, CPG world and, and then apply that to, to healthcare. So we will get to that shortly. But to get started, um, I own an agency called Aero Labs. We uh, design and build apps and websites for big companies, uh, big and small, I should say. But what I like to often kick this meeting off by saying is, you know, you may not know it, but we've likely already met. If you've ever used Disney Plus, if you've ever ordered uh, via the, the self-serve kiosk at McDonald's, if you've ever shipped anything at FedEx, rode a Peloton, used Southwest Airlines app, you have used products that my team has either designed, developed, launched, tested, or in some cases, all, uh, all of the above. Um, so again, my name is Andrew Neiman, and I've been trusted to design and develop apps and websites for some of the biggest brands in the world over the past decade. Uh, this is my team. We are not huge. We're about 45 strong. Um, but we are very specialized and we are very focused in uh, our specific area, dare I even say surgical, uh, given the audience we have here. So, uh, most of them are based in Chicago, some are down in Austin, some are up in Seattle, some are in the Carolinas. Um, post COVID, we've really embraced having a decentralized workforce and trying to co-locate closer to some of the, the big accounts we work with. Um, but some of which include, uh, big applications that we've designed and launched for companies like Toyota, uh, Southwest Airlines, which I mentioned, TurboTax, if any of you have ever used their consumer tax portal to, to fill out your own returns. Um, and then even more recently, and, and perhaps most impressively, Tesla, um, which was an awesome research project they uh, entrusted us with, trying to help figure out how they could recreate the perfect uh, offline showroom experience they've created and push it into the website, um, especially during COVID when people weren't getting out as much to go into the showrooms themselves. So while this all does sound very exciting and a lot of big, cool consumer brands and quite sexy, um, it did not start that way. Uh, and so I'm going to take a, a moment here to, to go back to the beginning of where this my, my journey in this technology began um, and give you a little sense for the what sort of happened in the industry at large. So it begins as a lot of things do uh, in my industry in 2007, when Steve Jobs goes to the Worldwide Developer Conference 
pulls the first Gen 1 iPhone out of his pocket and announces the new release of the phone and says, for the first time ever, Apple is going to allow third-party developers to build apps for the phone. That was a big deal because prior to then, while your phone did have some apps on it, it was locked down. You were stuck with whatever the developers originally uh, um, uh, built for the phone and you could not add new uh, apps as you went. So I couldn't have been further from knowing or caring about this in 2007, but fortunately a good buddy of mine that I went to college with went to this first uh, conference where Steve uh, unveiled the iPhone and I had grabbed lunch with him shortly thereafter. He and I had always talked about getting into business together back when we were in school. And he said, Andrew, I just saw the future. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you've got to look into this iPhone. You've got to look into the app store that they're releasing next year. I'm promising you five years from now, the world is going to run on smartphones. At the time I'm working in commercial real estate, he's considering a job with Deloitte. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I think you should just take the job with Deloitte and go. Uh, fortunately for, for him and, and then later for me, he did not. But my journey then takes uh, quite a divergence. So I'm considering a job in 2007 that actually moves me to the other side of the world in Abu Dhabi to do real estate development. I end up taking it. I move all the way out there. And I think at this point, that's probably the last I've seen of the iPhone for a while. It's the last I've flirted with this idea of doing anything in the mobile app space. And as life has a funny way of working out, I couldn't have been more wrong. So when I get to Abu Dhabi, the project I am assigned is to help master plan and develop um, what they call the Abu Dhabi Media and Technology Zone. So it is going to be a campus specifically designed to recruit Western technology and media companies from around the world to open up offices in Abu Dhabi. And I'm on the sales and leasing team. And lo and behold, the very first account that I am asked to chase to help recruit to the Middle East is Apple. And we get further and further down the road with getting them to open up a regional headquarters in Abu Dhabi. And they say, okay, we're interested in coming, but there's one stipulation. I said, anything. They said, we would like your company to invest in putting on an educational program to teach mobile app development to the youth of the Middle East region. And I said, ah, okay, um, what a wild coincidence. I know a little bit about this, enough to sound impressive in a first meeting, but you know, I'd love to come back to you with a proposal for what we could do. So I went deep down the rabbit hole now of, of learning about apps, how they work, how they're built, who uses them, called my friend back in the US, or it was Skype at the time, uh, and, and asked him to give me a deep dive. And eventually, um, we get to a point where we put together a proposal for this program. Apple uh, bites on it and says, yep, sounds good. We will come and open up an office there. But at this point now, I have... I have seen the light that my friend saw, so to speak. And now I can't focus on real estate development at all. And all I want to do is get into figuring out how to leverage app development. Well, and I think you said one where one time, uh, Andrew, when you uh, realized Apple was uh, going to open up apps for other people to build, you wanted to sell the shovels. Yeah, exactly to, right. To, to do that. Uh, kind of like the uh, uh, what Le Levi in California during the gold rush. He didn't want to yep. mine, mine gold. He wanted to sell blue jeans yep. to the miners. Exactly. So there was there was two ways to try and leverage this this boom. You can become the entrepreneur that has an idea for an app that wants to build it and put it in the store, and that is the equivalent of mining for the gold. Or you can take the safer, much more cash flow rich position and you can sell the shovels. And so my friend said, mm -hmm. I think the app store is primed to be a new sort of gold rush and I want to be the one to sell the shovels. Let's create an agency that is specifically focused on working with entrepreneurs to help get ideas out of their head and into the phone. Mm -hmm. This all sounds it, awesome. It, 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 so Andrew, uh, I think we're... Uh, you're going to go. This could be really interesting. Interest to us is that we could actually have apps for a lot of the stuff that we do that would fit onto 
a, and we're going to talk about this more, but that that's why I'm listening hard because I'm thinking, should MedBell have an app? And I guess your answer is, it could happen. Yeah, it could probably happen for any of our businesses. So as you're listening to Andrew talk about this, project yourself into this new world. Should our board, should our company, should our spinoff have an app on a phone? Yeah, it's it is it's a great business to be in because there's almost no one out there that isn't sitting on an idea for how they think that they could build an app or release a piece of technology that could transform their business or an industry that that they know about, which is great. The only trouble was when we first were getting this underway. So I mentioned 2007, the iPhone comes out. 2008, the App Store is unveiled. And 2009 is what I would call like the awkward teen years for, for app development. So for the first few years, the most popular apps in the App Store were essentially not more than parlor tricks. There was an app called Bump where you could tap your phones together. It traded contacts. Oh, wow. You know, there was an app called Red Scan where you could scan the barcode of a product and it would tell you what the price was. Very cool. And there was my personal favorite, uh, the number one paid app in the App Store called T-Pain My Voice, which just made your voice sound like the rapper T-Pain. And this was the peak of App Store innovation in 2009. So, you know, a little bit of a bummer for me because now I've just moved back from the Middle East to the US. We've got this business underway where we're building apps but we are grinding to try and figure out like, what is the proper application of these? I mean, at this point, I'm, you know, living in the third bedroom of a three bedroom apartment. I'm sleeping on an air mattress. I'm paying myself nothing. And thankfully in 2010, a couple of guys that are based in San Francisco have the idea to launch a company where you can order a taxi from your phone. That company was called Uber Cab, or as it would later become known, Uber. They launch in 2010 to a decent amount of fanfare on the West Coast. And just a couple of years later, they raise a $300 million Series B round. They, they expand nationally and even in some cases uh, internationally. And the company just takes off like wildfire. And this was probably the most significant turning point in the development of how apps are used by businesses because it caused... CEOs from all the companies, you know, across the globe to sit up in their chair and say, holy shit, look what you can do with an app. I thought it was Angry Birds. I thought it was just a bunch of games and parlor tricks. You can actually build a legitimate business. You can catalyze a business on the back of mobile applications. And so that is when our phones, you know, I stopped chasing as much and our phone started ringing and we were getting calls from the president of Discover Card, the CMO at Sears Holdings big, big businesses who are now saying, hey, we think it's time that we should figure out how to take advantage of this too. And over the next few years, you saw a couple of other well-known sort of first generation ideas take shape like uh, Instagram in 2011, Snapchat in 2012, Tinder in 2013, all of which gave existing business people and legacy businesses an idea for wow, should I be changing the way I'm designing for customer experience? Do I need to start to meet my customers, you know, in the in the environments they already know? Um, and this was, you know, this this was really the, the, the moment where our company went from kind of flat in terms of revenue to uh, doubling every year for a few years, getting up to about 40 employees in 2018, a little over 6 million in revenue. Um, and we had an acquisition offer we just couldn't turn down from a group in Dallas called Project 202 that was owned by a major multinational software company called Amdocs um, out of Israel. And so that was the, you know, while we were in the doldrums there early from like 2010, 11, 12, 13, um, had, an, had an excellent exit in 18. Um, and this is probably the point at which I would say I start seeing more healthcare uh, demand for mobile technology and apps, uh, which I can get into here in just a moment. Um, sorry, Jim, was there another question you had there? Well, did you create that company with the idea that you'd sell it or did you know, or how uh, prescient were you about this or uh, 
were you lucky? Uh, what uh, what do we have to learn from from your success? Well, there's no there's no such thing as uh, luck or sorry success without a little bit of luck, and we certainly had it in terms of timing. Mm -hmm. um, because we had chosen out of the gate to focus on mobile development, which was a huge, huge trend from about 2014 to 18, um, that a lot of big companies were trying to leverage. And it was admittedly at the time, what I would consider to be a young man's game, because while web development has been around for decades, and that was something you could learn in school growing up, if you, if you were into that field, mobile development really only began for smartphones in about 2010, Schools didn't really start teaching it until about 2012, 13. And so a lot of these bigger, more established software development agencies were trying to look for that like next generation or crop of talent that was really good at mobile that they could pluck. Um, we did not start it with the idea of selling it. Um, you know, when you start a, a services business, you're you're usually cash flowing decently um, out of the start, and you're not you don't have to raise a ton of money for it. Uh, you're not doing you know like what you would experience at a product or a SaaS company where you're building for a year with no income and you're sort of hoping for the best, and the outcome can generally be binary. But in this case, um, it was it was a company that we had worked on a project with together. They had seen our team before. They loved what we did. And they had sold us on this idea that they were going to go city by city and acquire some small mid-sized development agencies to then roll up into one national brand and try to then go after the work that's normally won by like Accenture or Deloitte um, or Digitas, you know, just at 30% cheaper. Yeah. So, it well, was well and, and, and Andrew, I would ask you, uh, is this a young man's game? You know, look around the room. We are not young men. Uh, any advice for us? Because it looks pretty generational. Who's the oldest person in that picture you showed of your company, for example? <laughs> the oldest, okay, fair question, Jim. I appreciate that. The oldest person in that photo of the company, uh, I think is 47. So mm -hmm. it is the development portion of how to actually like code an app in Swift or Kotlin, or I'm using a bunch of terms that probably sound like, you know, gibberish to you guys, but mm -hmm. to a degree, yes, building it, the engineering of it is kind of a young man's game. Getting into mobile apps is not though. Getting into it is as easy as I have an idea. I need to figure out how to turn my idea into a set of features or requirements. And then I need to enlist the help of a specialist or a professional um, or in many cases, an agency uh, to help try and build it. I will say if I have any any bit of advice for uh, for anybody that's considering building one or doing something entrepreneurial, it is not something that you can entrust to just one person. A lot of folks, and I will say especially you know that that are uh, less in the trenches of tech, they have an idea for something they want to build and they think all I need is, oh, I just need to meet a coder. I just need to meet a programmer and they can do it all. And that would be like saying, I want to make a movie and all I need to do is just meet an actor. <laughs> there are, there's so much more to it, you know, in terms of a screenwriter, a director, you know, the lighting specialist, the editor. Uh, it really takes at least uh, at, at the very minimum, if they're quite senior, like a three or four person team, but often, you know, a six to 10 person team to to take a big idea and carry it all the way to the finish line. Thank you. Yeah, most definitely. Um, there was one other key catalyst to our growth. Uh, and this is something I wanted to mention to you guys as being a really important thing to think about in your own businesses if you're not yet. Um, or if you are sort of on the consulting front lines, as some of you had mentioned, something that you should be talking about with your clients. And that is this notion that right now, and, and I'd say this probably started about six, seven years ago, we are very much in what I would call the age of the customer. And I, I best can exemplify this by saying, you know, if you go back probably uh, 15 years there was really considered to be two moments of truth to turn someone into a brand advocate. First moment of truth is I buy this new product I haven't done before, I haven't used before. 
Second moment is I try it. And if I liked it, I can convert into a brand advocate. But, and this is largely driven by the rise in mobile technology in the past you know, decade or so, there is, oops, sorry. There is now something that, that experts are calling the zero moment of truth. And that is when you research it. So by, by and large, at the point at which a customer is actually ready to consider buying something for the first time, they have likely already done an hour to three hours of research on whatever that product is. You probably would even, I, I don't know if you guys have done this. Certainly you've probably seen it done. But how many of you have been in the aisle of a store looking at a product on the shelf, maybe considering between two, you know, that seem pretty similar and you pull up your phone and you start researching it and you're looking at reviews and you're looking at, you know, what people are saying about it and what maybe, you know, you could pick up the packaging and just turn it over and start to look at it, but you don't, you pull up your phone because that is your trusted research advocate and you start looking into it before you buy it. This is why it is so critical right now to have a well-developed digital presence, a researchable presence, and one that comes across in a very positive manner to those folks who are likely going to research your product or service to death before they make a purchasing decision. And this is a big uh, sort of trend or wave that we've been helping a lot of our customers shore up and get better at. Um, Cool. Um, I'm happy to pause there for a second if there's any other questions before I jump into some of the healthcare work. But mm -hmm. okay. yeah, anybody, uh, any comments, thoughts, <laughs> clarifying questions? Well, I, I did. Uh, this is, a, I guess, the segue I was looking for is that so you've been doing all this stuff in other than healthcare arenas. What got you into healthcare? Because that's so important to you now and certainly important to us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what got me into healthcare was, okay. So at, at the risk of potentially, I don't think I'm going to, to tell anybody anything they don't know or wouldn't already say about their own industry here, but much of healthcare when it comes to technology acts as a laggard in the industry and not necessarily for you know their own preference there's just a lot of headwinds in healthcare that make implementing technology harder um it's a very highly regulated industry it is uh you know it is an industry that is generally been regarded in the past as like an essential service and hasn't necessarily always had to compete or market itself as hard as it does today um and so it was a bit i guess i would say i was almost a sort of waiting for healthcare to catch up to us before I was ready to dive in and, and, you know, take advantage of it and leverage it. Um, one of the major trends that has also sort of popped up in the past five years or so, I'd say, and I'd love to hear anybody on the call's perspective on this too, is that a lot of healthcare providers are now getting graded on or in some cases, even like have their pay or compensation tied to the notion of patient experience, um, which didn't, which, you know, 10, 15 years ago, wasn't always the case, or that was really hard to measure. It was tough to get that feedback. Um, but, but now that patient experience is becoming sort of a forefront rallying cry for a lot of different healthcare institutions and providers, they are starting to invest more in technology. And it has caused me to, uh, to dive much heavier into that industry. Um, and I'm happy to hear from any of you guys, if you have a perspective on like, you know, yeah, that sort of holds water. You're, <laughs> you're right in terms of us kind of coming to the game a bit late on some of that stuff, or, or you know, the, the notion of patient experience being a, a major um, catalyst for investment. But that that's what I've certainly found in the last five or six years. And that has led to, for me to take sort of a heavy shift out of a lot of what I've had previously worked in and start working more in healthcare. I'm going to show a few examples here now. Some are big company examples. Some are small entrepreneurial companies. Um, some are, you know, even startups within larger companies. They really do run the gamut. But the intent here is to show you guys a few different uh, samplings of how different healthcare companies are sort of diving headfirst into the innovation and leveraging the technology that's out there now 
if any of this, you know, gets the wheels turning for your own business, please bring it up after the fact. Would love to to chat through it more. Well, um, to put, uh, Edward, to put it into context, if I wanted to create an app for Medville or any any of the people around the room wanted to do an app, what would that cost? Uh, and I know <laughs> you can't say, but is there a range? Is it a lot of money? Is it not so much money? If you, if you are, okay. So to, that's a, always everybody's favorite question is what does it cost to build an app? And it's admittedly yeah. like saying, what does it cost to build a house? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, well, do you want two bedrooms or 10? Do you want, you know, a mansion or a bungalow? Uh, and so mm -hmm. it does run the gamut, but I would say at the very minimum, if you are looking to develop an app, a custom app, you should be prepared to spend no fewer than 150,000 bucks. Okay. Uh, they can get up on the high end, uh, you know, in excess of a million, um, you know, even a million five, I would not recommend going much higher than that for a first release. Otherwise you are likely over-engineering your first release, putting too much into the first release. And you would have been better off, you know, picking a budget that was half that and just getting to market and seeing what the, what the market reacts to. Um, but it is, it is significant upkeep. Um, and to be totally candid, you know, if you had said, should we do an app for Medville? I would say you should not build it custom because you don't have a team that's focused on maintaining it full time. What, what would be in your best interest would be to find something off the shelf that allows you to do some, you know, it's 80% done. And then the final 20% allows you to customize it for your business. Um, you know, building from scratch is definitely a, an undertaking. Uh, that being said, here's a commercial for this company that built from scratch. <laughs> um, so there was a business that was actually based um, here in Chicago that we were working with that was in the, in the field of student debt collection. Not a very... <laughs> Uh, you know, glamorous industry to be in, obviously a highly regulated one, and they face a lot of um, even public backlash for kind of just what their industry does in general and the amount of student debt accumulating in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So they come up with an idea to launch a business uh, because what they found in their research is that sadly, one of the largest causes for mental health problems for college students in the U.S., college students in the U.S., is student debt. And what they want to do is essentially Uberize the accessibility of mental health providers for college students. College for many is the first time you're away from home, you're away from your support system, you're not around, you know, the, the folks, your own folks or the you know, friends or people you know. And the sort of old world model of how you would access any sort of mental health guidance or professionals at a university. Um, was not really meeting the needs of the students today. It was, you know, go down to the, the student health center, check the schedules, see when there's availability, sign up by pen, you know, put that in your calendar, come back later. And they said, what we need to do is create a way where they can, they can manage their own um, schedules and needs and appointments online from their phone, and even perhaps chat with a counselor if there's one available on demand, if there's a seriously pressing issue. So this company went and, and built this application and I'll say this is a larger build. I mean, this is probably, this is over a million bucks, probably in like the 1.2 range because um, it is a two-sided marketplace. It involves, you know, automatically check, uh, checking, cross-referencing a student's insurance with uh, available counselors that take it. There's a lot of um, significant development here, but from an experience standpoint, the student is able, uh, the the company contracts with the school. The school then provides this app as a service to its students, um, which of course makes you know, the students feel good, makes the parents even feel better to know that this is something the university has that's unique. And the student can, you know, log into the app, say how they're feeling, um, say what's going with, you know, if something's, uh, if there's any sort of emergency issue versus something they'd be happy to just chat about when there's a first available counselor and they can see all the professionals in their area, schedule an appointment with them and even conduct the appointment over their phone, which believe it or not, is for many students today, the preferred method, the preferred channel of communicating with anybody, healthcare or otherwise. Um, so this was a great example of saying, 
you know, there is a there is an issue that's sort of sweeping across the U.S., especially for this young population that we want to tackle it with. Let's not force them to try to meet us where we are. Let's meet them where they're at. Um, it has been a pretty successful one thus far. Um, <clears throat> Connected Spine is actually a project that we worked on in conjunction with a neurosurgeon um, who had a very good relationship with uh, the folks at one of the largest physical therapy clinics in the Midwest. The neurosurgeon's problem statement was, I can't tell you the amount of times a patient comes in to see me because they have back pain and I am total overkill for what they need. You know, they don't actually have much of an issue uh, demanding of a neurosurgeon or any sort of surgery need, even if it's chronic, you know, long lasting back pain. After I diagnosed them, they should have just gone to physical therapy. I am like a referral engine for physical therapy. <laughs> And what he said was, what I'd love to do is create a digital intake system that uses kind of a, a decision tree, like a choose your own adventure matrix with a little bit of AI into it. And that, you know, before they ever come to my office or before they ever schedule an appointment with me, I can digitally diagnose whether they should be coming to see me or whether they should just go chat with a physical therapist. Um, and I even have a sample of how that works here. So the the assessment kind of mimics the same types of questions you might have on a traditional intake form when you're in the office, just presented in a much more, uh, you know, I think to, to Irv's point, uh, a customer experience expectation that matches what they're getting in other industries. Um, so, you know, you start filling out digitally, Am I filling this out for myself or someone else? It asks you a few key questions, fill in some basic info, and then you get into the, the decision tree piece of it. So, you know, what happened? I have, uh, I was injured when I hurt myself in a sports related activity. You know, uh, do your symptoms, did the symptoms start after the incident? Yes, they did. And you're kind of answering questions as though there's someone across the desk from you. It's not like a giant intimidating form. It's one question at a time. I'm giving you the prompts to, to answer them with. And with each one, you're getting a little bit further down the funnel of a diagnosis. You know, so a very cool tool that, that leveraged a lot of great modern technology to try to basically stop folks from you know, ending up in the wrong, in the wrong department of health, the healthcare system. Um, this was a very interesting one we did for Novo Nordisk um, that had to do with their insulin pen. So in this case, it was a companion app that allowed you to uh, essentially monitor your levels, um, report them back to other people that might be sort of caretakers or stakeholders in your healthcare journey. Um, and I'll show you. To update your here. dosage log, begin by flipping the device over. Touch the pen against the back of the device sliding it slowly across the surface until you hear a confirmation. Hold the pen in place for five seconds while dosage data is transferred. You will receive a second confirmation indicating your transfer is complete. Perfect, so that was one we took to market, I think it was about three years ago. Um, it had a great, great response from, um, Another one that, that was very fascinating to work on was, um, it's called Safe Start. It was developed by a surgeon uh, at Northwestern Medical Center here in Chicago. And the notion of it was to take the pre-surgery checklist, the timeout that, that occurs off of, uh, in some cases it was pen and paper and others that was even scarier. It was just on a whiteboard uh, and to try and prevent never events, or at least to be able to figure out where things went wrong if a never event occurs. Uh, a never event being, you know, we performed surgery on the wrong arm by accident. You know, we left a, uh, we left a, an opening, or we left sometimes even a tool um, in the surgical area. Um, a lot of times, you would go through the checklist in, in this, according to this surgeon. And you would, you know, make sure everything did check out at the time, but a lot, sometimes it was on a whiteboard and it would get erased after the fact. And there was no way to go back and actually see where did it go wrong or, you know, where did this mistake occur? So transferred it all onto um, an iPad that then began, began to get used. 
and also created um, sort of a summary or a recap of the surgery for the patient that they could then view when they got home. Uh, and, and I think this was to, um, to Paul's point about sort of like co-producing the care. There was a patient portal that would basically educate, better educate the the patient on what they were, you know, to be expected to do or need to do, or what was happening in this stage of the journey leading up to the surgery. They would then get to sort of fact check the info that everybody had on them before you went in for the surgery, and then you would get sort of a readout. You know, I'm I'm, I'm dumbing it down a bit, but similar to that like receipt you get from your Uber driver when you finish a ride that says, "Here was your driver. Here's how long the route took. Here's what it cost. Uh, you know, here was the car you were in." something that just made you feel a bit more like a co-collaborator in the, in the project, as opposed to just um, making it so transactional. And then the last one I'll show um, was one we did for Covidian. Um, we've done a good amount of work with them and, and Medtronic to actually try and help uh, make life easier for their employees. So going not towards patient experience here, but employee experience. This was uh, one of their very popular uh, ventilators that they sell to a ton of hospital systems and as you can imagine, looking at it was a really hard piece of equipment for the sales guy to like fit in his car or his van and take out on a road show and demo to doctors. And so what they asked us to do was simulate this product, but just put it on an iPad so that the, um, the healthcare providers could get a sense for how it worked and how it was better than what they're using now without, you know, the sales guy needing to lug all the equipment around. And so we created a a great version of it that was able to basically uh, enable those sales folks to meet more people in a day, you know, be less stressed in the field and help with retention of their, of their roles.